my name is Mohammed Hora, and we'll be changing gears a little bit. No longer talking about simulation. Uh, I'm director of carbon neutrality for PMT, which is performance manufacturing and technology, materials and technology. I mess it up all the time. Um, what we will be talking about a little bit is what is, you know, we have been talking about sustainability ESG all the time um, at this conference, and it's becoming a very important buzzword around the industry. The question is why? So let's go back in the history a little bit, and I'll try to see if this thing works for me. Right button. Oh, there we go. So it's a historical data fact and unanimous that Earth's temperature is rising. And you can see it through this graph that through different agencies, NOAA and NASA, uh, Met Office Hadley, and yet that it has gone up drastically over the last few years, especially since 1980s, you see a trend upward trend because the industrialization of developing world has started happening, industrialization in the rest of the world accelerated per se, and how we were using it, and a lot of emissions requirements had not been completely put into place yet. And then you go like, okay, so this is happening, hasn't it happened before in history? Um, is it for the first time? On the same slide, so. This is tricky. Is there, you guys, can you go to the slide? Oh, there we go. So uh, this is not historically done. It has, for the last nine years have been the hottest in the history of, recorded history of, um, temperatures have been recorded for what? About 1880 now. So last nine years have been recorded, which means we have more famine, which means we have more drought, which means we have more erratic weather patterns that lead to uh, destruction of life, a natural pattern, but also leads to destruction of business and destruction of uh, materials and resources that come out of the grounds. For example, if you're talking about a famine that's happening in a certain part of Africa, then that's created a national security issue in the United States. Because then somebody in Somaliland will move and then they are more gullible. It can have, have long-lasting effect towards different parts of the world that are, that's not thought about as direct, but it's there. So why is temperature rising? Why is it constantly happening? What's the next step? Can you go to the next slide? It's not working. Because we have dumped 49.8 gigatons of emissions into the atmosphere. That's literally it. These are the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, um, what have you, that go there. They create a dome. Heat comes in, cannot escape. That's literally it. The cooling mechanism of Earth is not working as well as it should work or how it's historically used to work before Human, human input started becoming part of it. Um, and a big part of it is energy. As you can see, the, the yellow part, that's the lion's share of it. it have, energy is a big part. We are consuming a lot more energy, which means we are producing a lot more energy, which means we're using a lot more resources. And if you go to the next slide, this is a snapshot of which sectors are using this energy, which, which sectors are creating these emissions. As you can see, energy is massive. A lot of it is into, but even that, if you break that, break it down, industrial energy usage is almost 25%, 24.2%, which goes into energy in production of materials, whether it's your cell phone, whether it's the chemicals that we use, the, whether it's uh, uh, medicine that we use, plastic bottles we use, whatever it is, cement, um, iron steel obviously has massive, but, but as you can see, chemical and petrochemical, which a lot of this stuff come out of, is also a pretty good chunk. It's about 3.6% of energy use. And not just that, but that's just on energy. If you go around and look at the, uh, on the left side where it says industry, 5.2%, chemicals is 2.2%. Cement is pretty massive, right? So energy consumption by industry is pretty drastic. Um, the the now this leads to what what is what's the next step why are we you know when we this is happening how do we resolve it that's the big question right so we'll spend a lot more time on the next slide please thank you um, well this is just a very basic definition this the graph is from EPA what's our carbon footprint what does it mean so carbon footprint is you know just think about your individuality per se 
So you, the jacket you got on, somebody made it, the cotton or the wool, was, the material was made somewhere, some certain amount of water was used, somebody made it, some machinery was used, electricity was used, some human hours were put into it. Um, all of that together, so, you know, um, basically the idea is the amount of emissions connected to a product or to an operation of a system, whether it's our household or whether it's some industry, is basically what our carbon footprint is. You mix it all together, and then there are three different types at this point. How it's defined as scope one, two, and three. This gives a little bit of an idea. Scope one, just think about it, you know, is going to be related to gas. If you're burning something within your fence, you're combusting natural gas, you have, um, uh, you have uh, diesel generators, what have you, scope one. Scope two, electricity, um, anything that somebody else is burning but you're bringing it in, electricity, steam, what have you. Scope three is materials. Um, that's outside your fence. Somebody else is producing it. You take that material, you turn it into a product, your feedstock, that turns into your scope three. Um, what is carbon neutrality then? Well, let's balance this emissions. How do we do that? Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so there are some, as, as, as you will see, what I tried to do is differentiate some of these in red and others are just gray. Um, and um, somebody made this comment yesterday. Um, this all list comes from ChatGPT, so, you know. Um, I, I consulted with the greatest resource on the planet at this time to come up with it, so, you know, bear with me here. Um, so carbon footprint analysis, we need to understand any industry, and I think um, industrial sector per se at this time is somewhat in earlier phase of understanding what its carbon footprint is. Um, a lot of industries are looking at the utility bills, but that just gives a small picture of it. Um, but what needs to happen is understanding of what we are producing, what we are consuming, what we are leaking, because if you're talking about any industrial facility, think about a refinery or think about a chemical plant, if there is a connection somewhere, there's likely a leak at that point as well. Um, air compressors, if you have compressed air system somewhere, there's likely a leak there as well. So understanding all of that, understanding really what your footprint is, not just based on estimation because APA gave a guideline, is I think very important to realizing what our baseline is, and from there we can go into what we, we need to get to. And then once we know our baseline, the second part is what do we want to do about it? Very important question. Um, do we want to reduce it 10%, 50%? When do you want to reduce it by? Do you want to reduce it um, in the next 20 years, 30 years? Right now, a lot of the industrial trend is that we are seeing a lot of companies go from what, 2040, 2050 is where a lot of companies are, it's actually big uh, Fortune 500 companies are going, you know, that's their target. They want to be carbon neutral or they want to reduce it by a certain extent. Once you do that, then you need to take all of that data that you had in your footprint analysis and then come up with at maybe your asset level, right? You're looking at your boilers, you're looking at your compressors, you're looking at whatever system you have, and then you look at how can we do things to make it more efficient, how can, whether it's energy efficiency or make them better. How are they performing? Look at their performance and look at their, um, I think the word would be carbon intensity, right? So whether you look at the production base, you have metric tons per product created, metric tons per tons of product or revenue, what have you, but you need to come up with that. And then you go into implementation of it. Um, a lot of companies are looking into offsetting because, you know, if you're a chemical, if you make chemical, you can't make a green chemical, right? There's just chemicals, so it's part, it's real, the, the the reality is that at some point you have to do some offsetting of that because you can't completely reduce it. At this point, maybe in future new technologies will come and we'll have um, lower GWP chemicals and that's fine. But at this point, we're not there yet. And lastly, and I think this is very, very important, I come from the world of performance contracting where we'll do a project and the whole project will be monitored and uh, MNV will be done, monitoring and uh, verification, measurement and verification. The whole idea is that you prove what you saved and since we are in the early stages of this carbon neutrality pledge, we haven't really figured out how to do that. So once you figure out your carbon footprint, you have all the data sets, and you have, you have figured out how much you're going to reduce, it is important to prove that you're reducing that year over year after year, right? You do a project this year. So for example, I am part of Honeywell PMT, and my, we have a goal to go carbon neutral um, 
in the next 13 years or something. So if I do a project this year, and I'm thinking, okay, I do this project, it will reduce 100,000 metric tons per year. I have to go and measure it to make sure that it does keep on reducing 100,000 metric tons, right? So I have to look at it, I'll report it, and I see, oh no, for this year it reduced 90,000, so I need to go back, I need to optimize that process, I need to optimize that equipment, whatever that is, go back, look at it again, maintain it, and then go back and update my, uh, update my goals. So because my plant could have expanded, there might have been a growth plant, uh, there might have been a growth uh, initiatives, what have you, you're using, producing more, or you're producing less, any number of things, new regulations came in, you can't use certain things, all of that needs to be optimized and continuously monitored. Lastly, and I think um, I am kind of, um, we are a bit ahead of the game in terms of that we have a mandate um, directly from my CEO of Honeywell and CEO of PMT that we need to go carbon neutral. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what I uh, do at Honeywell. So in Honeywell, we have a mandate that we need to be carbon neutral by 2035. We have a base, our baseline is based on 2020. Um, and by 2030, I need to become, we have um, signed up for SBTI, science-based target initiative, um, and we have to reduce it by 50% by then. Um, SBTI does not allow you more than 5% offsets, so offset is really not in my game plan at this point. Maybe after 2030, we'll, you know, we'll think about it. At this point, it's not in the game plan. Right now, I need to figure out how to get to from 2020 baseline to 2030, which is 50% reduction, and then I have five more years to go to 100% um, cut to carbon neutrality. So, so what you see on the left side, um, the little boxes, the yellow ones, uh, sorry, blue. So we're looking at, these are basically different buckets that we are doing every project in. So we look at operations optimization. How are things being run? Are they being run the same way they have been run for the last 20 years? Can we optimize it? Can we remove some of the pain points? Are there too many, you know, it's just a sim simple example. If you have a pipeline going somewhere, it has a lot of turns. Every turn means you're losing efficiency. Every turn means you're connecting some more stuff. Every turn means you're leaking. Going to optimizing, look at, looking at that, or how operators optimize, how they react to it. So some of the stuff that, you know, the presenters before were talking about, how are they reacting to certain situations? We are looking at all of that. Renewable energy is obviously biggest part, a big part of it. We are looking at peop, um, installing on-site solar, trying to buy premium power, so we buy green power where it's available. Um, things like power purchase agreements, so you don't want to invest big capitals in it. At least in the United States, we can do that. And Europe, we can do that. We haven't seen a lot of power purchase agreement type of deals in um, Asia Pacific, uh, maybe some in Australia, but really not um, in much of the world. Is where you don't put capital in, somebody else puts the capital in, you buy power at a certain point. And another big thing um, is VPPS, virtual power plants, right? So you buy a big power plant somewhere else, the green power is put in the grid, solar power is put in the grid, the grid is somewhat green, you don't get the same electrons in your, in your facility, but you get the renewable credits, I guess. So you don't use the same electrons, but get the credit. Fuel switching, electric, uh, energy efficiency and sustainability, I think that's pretty common, pretty much everybody is doing. Um, you upgrade your equipment, make it more sustainable, make it more efficient. Um, and that goes into a very important part is that uh, what I try to, when I work with my site leaders, uh, we, we try to talk about how ener um, carbon neutrality isn't another burden on you, but if your facility is more carbon neutral, suppose you're going towards carbon neutral, right? So you do certain projects, you do energy efficiency projects. First, it helps me with my sustainability goals. And then it helps the facility become a bit more reliable because you have newer equipment, your equipment is maintained properly, you have a better um, O&M plan, per se. And then, which means your system, your facility is more reliable, which means you have higher resiliency, you have lower downtime, which means you're producing, your, your dollar per product is higher, right? Just the whole idea, it becomes a lot more sustainable, it becomes a lot more um, useful for the facilities. Fuel switching, electrification is pretty big. A lot of big stuff that we have, uh, for example, if you're running a large chemical plant or something like that, you have large boilers. Kind of hard to go from what's existing, but at the same time, like gas boiler to electric boiler is kind of hard, but you could still, like some of the projects that we would look at is, uh, can we have maybe hydrogen is not ready at this time, right? It's not, um, 
it's not scaled up yet where it can replace like you know large plants and you can just go into hydrogen because you'll use a lot more hydrogen it has lower heat value and all of that but if you're making an upgrade you can certainly make it a hydrogen ready project which means you can start blending in some of that uh, hydrogen into your natural gas and you can start reducing in some time in future when the scale has gone up it becomes useful carbon capture sequestration um, that has to just happen you know nature of our industry we just have to do it we won't be able to reduce all the carbon but we have the ability to go capture it um, digitalization and this is extremely important and I, when I look at digitalization I don't just look at automation so automation is very important so that the human error factor goes away and then you look at data and you look take all that data analytics because data is becoming extremely important the more you look at how your system works you look at um, so for example, let's think about, I'm looking at boilers across my, uh, my role is global, so I look at all of honey, all of PMT plants throughout the world. So if I'm looking at a boiler that sits in the United States, in Louisiana somewhere, and I look at a boiler that sits, sits in Malaysia or something, and they're somewhat similar, and I'm looking at it, and they're about the same age, and, but they're, and you're looking at all the KPIs that are attached to the boilers, and you see that for some reason, the boiler in Malaysia is performing at a higher level than the boiler in Louisiana. Something is going on, right? We're running it differently. Maybe the feed is different. Maybe the boiler needs to be worked on. Uh, maybe the boiler is, um, the condition that the boiler is sitting in is different. So we, we see the vibration added. We see the temperature added. We see the, um, uh, we, we see the water temperature that's coming out or whatever chemical you have in there. All of that is looked at. Once you look at all of that, then you can kind of combine it all and then it creates somewhat of a minority report sort of thing, right? You're, pre you're doing preventive maintenance. You can go fix it before it really breaks down. So you're not running your plan to the ground, but you're looking at from a higher level, knowing what's happening so you can budget out, say, in the next six months, seven months, I need to put effort in it. Um, so digitalization then helps with carbon neutrality one, because then you can also take that data and now we are now no longer estimating it. We have measured it. It's credible data set. And now that reporting is coming in, Europe already has started. Same thing is going to happen here pretty soon. And once that happens, we have better data to go for and uh, present. After 2030, we are looking, we're hoping that there's high industry transformation. Like we're talking about hydrogen will maybe become more available. It will be more useful. Um, maybe we'll look at different business optimization. We'll see, you know, going from one type of chemical different. Who knows? And um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, I think this was the last slide. Yep, I think I was within 20 minutes. Thank you.